Hi everyone, I'm Ev. Um, unfortunately, I can't be in school today, uh, which is quite a shame because it's always some good fun to come back to school. But uh, I hope that you will enjoy my story as much as through this video. Today I'm going to speak about something that is quite important for us, which is food. Um, in the last four years, I have been studying and investigating the impact of food on our bodies and health. I first started looking at food at a molecular level. I began learning about the various functions of glucose, you know, the simple form of sugar, but also about the ongoing research around interactions between food and our bodies. I'm talking about this recent finding, for example, of this gene that can partly explain why some people strongly dislike coriander. I'm talking about this guy that will make the herb taste like soap. My first experience in this field was during my bachelor thesis on maternal and child nutrition. Indeed, for two months, I worked as a nutritional science researcher in a town called Awasa in the southern region of Ethiopia. It is during this time that I discovered the complexity and importance of nutrition in how we grow and thrive as human beings. In Ethiopia, I was specifically looking at the association between the food intake and the maternal care of women during pregnancy with the birth weight of their newborn. It was quite fascinating and you'd be surprised, surprised how closely related a mother's health is to her child's health even before pregnancy. Indeed, past studies have found that nutrition practices and intake can have a strong impact not only on one, but two generations after. In brief, the way you eat, digest and store food may strongly be shaped by the way your grandmothers used to eat. From this ensued different theories on genetic and intergenerational predispositions to certain body mechanisms and even diseases. From one of those theories include, for example, the thrifty phenotype theory, which I think is well represented by this quote from Bray, which says, the genetic background loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. This is why I decided to apply to a master's program that really focused on nutrition and global health. This is notably where I grasp how critical the nutrition situation is in the world today. Even though there have been some improvements in health, the number of mal malnourished children and adults is still too high and unequally distributed around the world. Malnutrition in all its forms, which includes undernutrition, poor growth, nutrient, malnutrition, overnutrition and obesity, affected more than 2 billion adults and 300 million children in 2019 worldwide. Those are big numbers. Today we know that an inadequate nutrition is not only about eating the right amount of good nutrients, but it's also about being healthy physically and mentally, having a good hygiene, but mostly being able to access, afford and know which foods are good for you. We can also now add to this list the impact of growing up in a healthy environment, you know, of healthy parents and grandparents. Luckily, some people in this world are privileged enough to tick all the boxes, but most people don't. Last year, I took part in a health study looking at vitamins supplementation in HIV positive children in Lusaka, the capital city of Zambia. We gave HIV positive adolescents vitamin D and calcium and looked at their physical and neurological development, but also their health. We also asked them about their social and economic status. So we asked them about uh, if they had any education, if they have received any education, in what year they were, uh, in what kind of house they were living in. But we also asked them about their dietary intake, which means that we asked them about what did they eat in the last 24 hours. 
From this, we saw that most HIV positive adolescents were also affected by malnutrition, specifically undernutrition and poor growth. But they were also affected by other infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis or malaria, and living in poor conditions. Indeed, in the 1990s, Zambia was hit by an HIV crisis, which affected many adults and children afterwards. In addition, the country still reports very high numbers of undernourished children in urban but mostly rural areas that are in urgent need of care. For example, 35% of children under 5 are undernourished in Zambia today. Some literature already exists on how to adequately, adequately treat those children. And in this specific context, programs and interventions are currently in place in the country. However, Zambia, like many other countries, is currently breath being threatened by another burden. Since the last decade, Africa, and more intensely, Sub-Saharan Africa, is currently experiencing the double burden of malnutrition. What is this double burden? Well, it's about seeing in the same population or even the same family, people affected by too little and too much food at the same time. Indeed, many countries still report very high levels of undernutrition, but also at the same time a growing burden of overweight, obesity and non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases are diseases that are not infectious and usually include cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, stroke, which is often combined with hypertension, and in some cases, cancer. So what happened? As seen globally, in the last 30 years, the continent has experienced a rapid economic and population growth with an increased food availability, availability in urban areas. In addition, local diets are more and more westernized, causing a nutrition transition from eating vegetables and staple foods, such as rice and wheat in these countries, to eating more meat and bread, but mostly highly processed foods, which are higher in calories, salt and sugar. Here are the four groups of food processing. Uh, they, it goes from the first group, which are foods that are very mildly or actually not processed, to group four, where foods are really highly processed. And they're actually the ones that are more common. Uh, actually, you may recognize some of them, or even you had one this morning, or one for lunch. This double burden of both under and over nutrition in the same population, and even during one's individual life course, it's a serious problem and is so complex to treat and prevent. In the last 10 years, the capital city of Zambia, Lusaka, has seen its streets filling up with fast food restaurants and its supermarkets with highly processed snacks. In addition, cars have become more accessible and income has increased in most urban areas. But what makes it so complex is that the body remembers everything. There are many instances of people that are today adults that have their parents or even themselves experienced food depletion and undernutrition in their childhood. Unfortunately, studies have found that such trauma during childhood strongly impacts digestion and storage mechanisms later in life. Meaning that the intake of highly caloric foods in adulthood, such as those highly processed foods in someone that experienced undernutrition as a child will enhance the risk of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes or cardiovascular diseases later in life. Unfortunately, when you look at the 10 leading causes of death in lower and middle income countries during the last 20 years, 
the first two are non-communicable diseases. Well, one may think, well, those diseases already exist elsewhere. Um, I think we all know someone that has diabetes or maybe that was affected by cancer. For example, those are a big issue in the United States of America. So we already know a couple of treatments and prevention strategies. So that's good. I mean, we can act fast. However, due to the history of inadequate nutrition and increased genetic predisposition in the affected population, the diseases are different and more complex. Indeed, some People, some adults, are already diagnosed with heart disease at the age of 30 years old. I mean, this is 10 years earlier than the average in higher income countries. These diseases are rising at a faster rate and with more devastating effects in those lower income settings. So what can be done? Well, unfortunately, many countries in the sub-Saharan region don't have regulations or policies already in place regarding nutrition and food, which makes the implementation of campaigns and guidelines more difficult. In addition, there's quite little evidence and knowledge on which interventions or, or campaigns that can successfully treat and prevent such burden in this specific context. Indeed, considering the context and environment surrounding a population in need of a program or an intervention is critical for its success, acceptability and long-term impact. Many previous healthcare and interventions have failed or even created more harm due to their lack of a specific and detailed analysis of the local situation. However, this is not the end. So what are the solutions? Well, there, ha there is more and more evidence of improvements with programs adopting a more multi-sectorial life cycle approach. A multi-sectorial approach basically refers to activities undertaken by various non-health and health sectors to modify health and health related outcomes. But how would a life cycle program work? Well, a life cycle program would first aim on the protection of fetal and early childhood growth to address maternal and child nutrition. Then, later in life, during adolescence, it would aim to promote education on healthy life practices and healthy diets using schools and children's groups. Of course, this would be done in parallel to the improved access and availability of healthy foods. Finally, finally, during adulthood and for the elderly, the goal is to raise awareness on non-communicable diseases about their drivers and impact using national-wide campaigns in addition to the improved access of treatment, but mostly early screening. The sooner you found out you are sick, the better the treatment will be. Many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa already have in place prevention programs for infectious diseases. There are many opportunities to integrate non-communicable diseases prevention and care into those programs. So, as we have seen, to make sure that those programs and campaigns actually work and reach the population affected, they need to be thoroughly prepared, funded of course, but they need to have had a very precise and detailed investigation of the local context. However, those programs really represent the chance to prevent further suffering and death in countries affected by this double burden of malnutrition. Well, I hope that with this story, I made you grasp the complexity of nutrition-specific treatments and preventions, but mostly while designing those interventions, the importance of taking into account the context, but mostly the people that will benefit from it. Um, of course, it's not because something worked out in a country that it will also work out in a 
another. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you will enjoy this TEDx presentation as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you and have a nice day.